So if I can officially welcome everyone to the new series of Science for Development webinars. Like I say, my name's Aaron Towers. I'm Development Education Officer for Self-Help Africa and your host for the panel discussion. Just to introduce the, the first of our new series of Science of Development webinars, where we hope to inspire new projects uh, for next year's event through raising awareness of our award along with Irish Aid that we present every year at the event, the Science for Development Award. Uh, awareness of this award isn't very high at the moment. Uh, so we want to raise that awareness and get more projects with an environmental, global environmental and, and social issues uh, focus. So with this in mind, we're gonna have a series of work of webinars and each has the same uh, broad structure, each, like this one will have now, is that we will have um, students with uh, presenting a project from this year's uh, award. So this, this uh, webinar, we have Christopher and Mikolai uh, from Clonakilty Community College. And then we will also each time we'll have a past winner of the award uh, today we have Timothy McGrath, who was the 2018 winner, and who is now studying computer studies and economics in UCC. And then at each webinar will feature scientists, both here in Ireland and uh, abroad, in particular scientists that are connected to Self-Help Africa programs here and in Africa. So we... We have today with us Jesse Dolliver, who's studying a master's in botany in, in Trinity in Dublin, and helps us each year at the BT Young Scientist identifying projects that fit the criteria for uh, the development award. And we also have uh, one of our lead agricultural scientists from Zambia with us, uh, Axon, uh, who's gonna talk uh, to us about his work in the field uh, of, of agricultural science out in Zambia and the um, programs and challenges that they are facing uh, in his work there right now. All this hopefully to inspire students that are thinking about projects, but also students that have already done projects and um, hopefully maybe are thinking of being scientists in the future and, and maybe find ways of areas of study that may interest them and career options uh, into the future. So to begin with, I'd like to go to the students in the Clonakilty Community College. We have Christopher and Mac, uh, Michelet here, and they did a project in this year's um, competition focused on um, food containers and the use of mycelium. Um, and for the event, they created a video um, as a way of being assessed or, or to introduce their project. So we thought to use that as a way to illustrate their research and then we'll hear from them. Hello, my name is Christopher O'Donovan and I'd like to present our BT Young Scientist Project about mycelium food containers, which my partner, Nikolai Aramis, and I have researched. In the past 70 years, humanity has produced over 7 billion tonnes of plastic. Despite widespread efforts to reduce plastic waste, most of it ends up in landfills, incinerated or littered on our streets. The packaging industry is the biggest culprit of this and is responsible for the most plastic waste in the world. We attempted to combat this by creating a biodegradable, disposable container that will return back to nature after it is used. Unlike plastic containers, which remain almost indefinitely. We eventually decided to use mycelium to create these containers. Mycelium are the roots of mushrooms and when fully grown become very tough and insulative. 
We also decided to coat the container in beeswax to protect the mycelium from liquids which can damage it and stop it from coming into contact with the food. We made moulds in the shape of the containers and filled them with mycelium, water, wheat husks for the mycelium to eat. We then left them to grow and morph into the shape of the container. Afterwards, we tested the strength of the mycelium versus a plastic container and also how well each container kept in heat, which is vital for a food container. Hello, I am Mikolai Aramis. After testing the mycelium container and the plastic one, we formed many observations. The mycelium performed admirably. These graphs show the results for the heat retention test and the pressure tests that we performed. As you can see, the mycelium container did slightly worse in both areas. This can be attributed to the fact that the mycelium container had not fully grown due to time restrictions. Nevertheless, with these setbacks, the mycelium container still did quite well and gave some good results. We concluded our project saying that with some further developments, the mycelium container could outperform the plastic ones. This can be accomplished by allowing the mycelium extra time to grow and solidify. Further research and development can also greatly improve the product and discover more hidden benefits of mycelium. We also researched the viability of the mycelium container in a market environment and discovered that this product could do well commercially if the tactics are refined and more industrial machinery is used. The mycelium container has high potential and further advancements could result in it becoming greater and a viable alternative to current disposable containers. So uh, Michelle and Christopher, who are, who are in school uh, now, joining us from Clonakilty, uh, that video was made before you experienced the, the BT Young Scientist and all the talking you must have done uh, about your project since. So uh, can either of you tell us a little bit of how, how your thoughts have developed on your research since that video? Uh, a bit of time has passed since then. Uh, I suppose now thinking back on it, uh, we would have liked to do a lot more experimenting at the time allowed it. Uh, seeing as we were kind of under uh, a constraint of time working through, even working through Christmas to get the books and uh, all the projects done for uh, being scientist in January. And uh, looking back on that, we also would have made uh, a lot of improvements. Like um, after the young scientists, we discovered that uh, our growing environment wasn't ideal uh, because to avoid the cold temperatures in the lab at night, we put the mycelium that was growing in the containers in a sort of uh, oven. But now we know that it was uh, it may have been a bit too dry, seeing as uh, mycelium needs quite wet uh, temperature, uh, quite wet um, environments to grow. Uh huh. Uh huh. And um, maybe, uh, Christopher, could you tell us um, how did you come to this idea for your for your project? How did you how did you land and decide that mycelium was the uh, the, the medium that you were going to research? Uh, well, uh, we've always been hearing about um, plastic waste and the uh, negative effects it has. It's kind of in society as a whole and we decided we wanted to do something to help combat it. Uh, we saw companies such as Microwax and the cooperative, uh, both companies who use mycelium to uh, create such things as uh, packaging like foam uh, products and also such things as clothing. Uh, so we saw that mycelium has a wide range of applications and we thought we could use this to help reduce plastic wastage. And since we saw that food packaging was the biggest culprit of wastage, we thought we'd try to combine the two together to uh, form an uh, alternative, uh, a theoretical alternative to the plastic wastage. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's obviously a, a, a massive problem uh, worldwide and, and one that we're all aware of, but probably not really aware of just how bad uh, it, it is. Um, like there's two things about coming up with an idea, but then the idea being acceptable to people. So uh, when you have um, expressed this idea of a mushroom, uh, fungus uh, 
container for, for say, food that uh, people are going to maybe get their takeaways from? What kind of responses did you get from, uh, you know, how acceptable is this to people when you, when you suggest it? Well, uh, I asked around uh, some friends and family, and to be honest, the biggest response that I got was uh, that it was disgusting and no one would ever like, consider eating from a mushroom container. <laughs> but I suppose uh, if you emphasize how much better it would be than plastic, and really, if it's taken, uh, if people take care to uh, create the container to make it look acceptable and uh, within safety standards, as it would obviously have to um, be corresponding to those, then I really don't see any reason why it should be more, uh, why it should be considered disgusting to use mushrooms and uh, as an alternative. It, it just takes uh, that shift in understanding, doesn't it? Uh, and um, champions to, to, to start it. Uh, and so, we have to, like I say, there are companies out there that are trying uh, different approaches. Um, so, and, and then there's the economic side of things as well. Uh, to com compete with what seemingly is a, such a, a cheap uh, thing that is making something out of plastic. Uh, but we're very aware now um, that there are hidden or not very hidden uh, costs uh, to that. Um, so maybe uh, thanks, um, Christopher and, and McLeod, for that. Uh, if, I, if I can ask, uh, go to Jesse. Uh, and ask you uh, as a as you're doing your masters in in trinity in in botany um and i know you you know a bit about the projects of this year and the boys project there uh that you probably have quite the understanding of what mycelium is and its uh, importance to ecosystems the guys project was really interesting i was working in a lab once where we actually had um lab materials delivered in mycelium packaging um, but the mycelium material would get all over the equipment so it's really interesting that you guys use beeswax as a coating so it's very innovative um, yeah there's obviously a direct use of my um, mycelium for people you know we we it's high in protein so we eat it it's the vegetative part of a fungus um, and people are doing very creative stuff with it as well. People have been growing mycelium in coffee grounds, waste coffee grounds, and then using it as a source of protein. So there's all these kinds of direct uses um, that we can have for mycelium, but also, yeah, they're very important in ecology. So there's a couple of different funguses which actually form symbiotic relationships with plants. So a symbiotic relationship is, is one where both parties get a benefit. So there are these funguses that grow around the roots of plants and it's a kind of a win-win situation because the funguses get um they get carbohydrates sugars from the plant which they use to keep themselves alive and then because they can grow out in such a wide kind of net they can get extra nitrogen from the soil and extra other um minerals and, and vitamins and things that the plants need and direct them to the roots of the plant. So they're really important. And from a crop science perspective, people are now working on trying to um, basically plant seeds that are coated in these funguses so that when the crop starts growing, it has a better chance in life because it's got access to these extra nutrients. So they're really important um, from an ecological perspective. They're largely hidden from from view uh, we don't know uh, much about them generally uh, so as a function uh, so that's really interesting so um, I know a little bit Jesse that you combine you know science passion for science uh, with being an activist uh, in environmental and, and social issues so I wondered, could you tell us a little bit about how you combine your your interests and passions? Generally speaking, you're not supposed to combine your passions and your activism with your science because science is supposed to be objective and it's supposed mm -hmm. to be completely without emotion and that you do everything in a very methodical way. Um, but we wouldn't do experiments on these kinds of things if we didn't care about them, if we didn't care about climate, if we didn't care about plastic waste. Um, and a colleague of mine recently, she works on badgers and she, she found a badger that she'd been studying for a long time and had been run over by a car. Um, and she was very upset about it, obviously, because she'd been tracking this badger for five years. 
and she was saying you know like I know I'm not supposed to care about it because I'm a scientist and this is like my subject matter but obviously she studies badges because she cares about them so it's kind of hard not to be um <laughs> emotionally yeah. invested but do you keep your experiments objective but your kind of passion for the subject is what drives you and kind of motivates you through all the long hours and the long shifts in the lab and stuff my research will be like super, super specific and very narrowly focused. And then I also organize with like a group called Not Here, Not Anywhere. And we do anti-fossil fuel, um, anti fuel campaigning. And that's a weekly meeting. So sometimes when you're doing science, you're kind of like, this is not going fast enough because everything in science is quite long and quite specific. If you, if you care about these things, then try and pair both. Do, join an activist group <laughs> and keep going with your research as well, because they're kind of different time scales. What was, what was the name of, the, of that group that you mentioned? Oh, it's called Not Here, Not Anywhere. Um, not here. Yeah, Not Here, Not Anywhere. We campaign against fossil fuels in Ireland. Um, and we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, anywhere you want to find us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that your part of your research uh, focuses on seaweed. Tell us briefly about seaweed. Yeah, well, I love seaweed. I'm kind of researching two aspects of it. So one is that it's a carbon sink. So in the same way that rainforests and forests are carbon sink and draw down carbon from the atmosphere, things that grow in the sea do the same thing. So um, seaweed actually sequesters carbon. It, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere at the same rate as like a tropical rainforest. But we kind of often forget to account for it and put it in global carbon models because it's under the water. And it's like, um, you know, if you can't see it, then you kind of forget about it. So I'm researching what kind of carbon sequestration seaweed does. And then I'm also interested in it as a crop because um, it's, it's if you grow a crop in water, you don't have the same competition for land. Um, you don't have a requirement of using up fresh water. Um, and you don't have a requirement to fertilize because seaweed like sucks up nutrients from the water. So it's very interesting um, as a potential crop for Ireland um, because yeah, it's good for all these reasons. So it's a growing area. There's lots of seaweed farming around Ireland, but it's kind of something that you don't hear about. No, no. Yeah, much like uh, mycelium, uh, we can't see it, uh, and it's not, and it's not traditionally uh, used or utilized. So, um, yeah, the, our awareness is is very limited. Uh, speaking from for myself, uh, so <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Thank you, um, Jesse. So, if I can go over to Zambia and to Axon, and uh, who is our or Self Help Africa's and. Um, agricultural scientists in the field office in um, Lusaka, the, the capital of Zambia. Um, I don't know, Axon, having heard uh, what Jesse was talking about there and our students in, in Klonakilti, um, if, if any thoughts come to your mind about your work and how you are trying to improve and, and diversify uh, the agricultural practices in Zambia? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm saying I followed closely what um, the earlier two presenters and Jesse shared, and it got me thinking because it feels like we are solving um, our global problems using um, solutions that are developed regardless of where they are, but uh, serving the same purpose. Because in our line of work, especially as regards developing um, um, a biodegradable container, was was key to me, especially where we are promoting under post harvest loss management. We are promoting uh, the use of uh, PIX bags and the use of uh, hematic, other hematic storage uh, facilities like the silos. And these, of course, we've had issues that come up from the field as regards uh, uh, disposal once, once we, we, uh, we are done using them. And if, if that's, that's a technology that's well developed and harnessed can fit into our programs. Because as a country office, well, we are running eight, eight projects right now. And each of those is trying to address um, different aspects of which the major components on those projects are agricultural uh, production in terms of promoting uh, alternative livelihoods, especially for other areas where there's endangered, uh, endanger, endangering of um, uh, natural resources. Then also promoting uh, uh, functional uh, functional landscapes, 
in terms of forest uh, regeneration. And so under these components, we are quite strong on uh, climate smart agriculture. And under that, we are promoting intensification of agriculture, where we are making sure that people do not clear vast pieces of land to do what they're doing, but try to intercrop on uh, small pieces of land to try and preserve the forest, because we've seen there's a lot of um, uh, increase in terms of uh, forest clearing and in terms of um, uh, opening up new lands and that's affecting our environment as well as our carbon sinks and so we're trying by all means to make sure that that is harnessed through the intensification program uh, intercropping as well as uh, promotion of that as well as the other project that we're implementing is also promoting now hydroponics the use of hydroponics especially in schools as a pilot after which we can roll it out to different communities where people are growing crops especially fruits and vegetables in the water uh, medium without the use of soils because we've noticed that uh, one with the soils we are talking about issues of pests and disease infestations we're also talking about the issues of uh, law uh, availability of land and you try to make sure that you use the available uh, uh, little pieces of land and resources sustainably that's 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 what came to my mind as regards that mm -hmm. but of course we're also doing other 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 programs that feed into all this whole sphere of natural resource uh, uh, conservation programs where we are promoting the um, uh, the village uh, natural resource management components where we are making sure that farmers as well as uh, um, rural dwellers get involved in the programs that we're implementing in the field. It's whole a different complex sphere of development, but one feeds into the other. And this sounded very interesting to me. Great. Uh, thanks for that. There's a lot in, in what you just said there. Uh, I love the, the idea of climate smart agri agriculture. Uh, sure. I hadn't heard that as a term, so that's a, a great one to for us all to um, consider and, and think about climate smart agriculture. Uh, you mentioned there um, intercropping, which I, I imagine you mean um, you're growing beneficial crops uh, together or beside or in between. C can you give us an example in Zambia of, of what what crops uh, you would you would be uh, referring to there? All right, um, mostly intercropping. And what I liked what Jesse earlier stated that she's doing research, she did some work on uh, legumes and uh, on uh, cereals because that's the major uh, intercrop that usually gets to be appreciated even for us in the field where farmers are growing legumes alongside cereals. So they'll grow beans, uh, Fasciolus vulgaris, that's the scientific name, alongside ziamese or corn, you people might call it corn. Uh, so they go it in, in rows. And then if every after each line, you have a different crop of the same. same. So you have maize in the two lines, then you have uh, uh, legumes in the other two lines and maize. And you might do legumes or you might do um, uh, maize alongside cassava as, as an intercrop because one crop will mature before the other one uh, fully develops. So those are type of uh, intercrops that we are trying to promote to make sure that farmers make, maximize the use of uh, the small pieces of land. And looking at nutritional value um, uh, rather than, than purely the quantity of, of, uh, that you can produce. I, I was lucky yeah. enough to be in Zambia and, and met Axon earlier in the year and, um, and or, or earlier last year, I should say, and um, saw how the important uh, keeping the tree cover was over your, your fields uh, and then and the, the, the mulch the tree leaves uh, provided, uh, the shade from the harsh sunlight, um, and also encouraging birds to, to be in and around the farms as a, as a, a natural um, a way of getting rid of pests. And I thought all that was very interesting. Thank you, thank you, uh, Exxon, for that uh, and for joining us. Um, it leads uh, very nicely, I think, to our final panelist and speaker, uh, Timothy McGrath, uh, who's waiting patiently, uh, also somewhere in Cork, uh, studying in UCC. And he won uh, our Science for Development Award in 2018. And I'll leave him to talk a little bit about uh, his project that won. 
Uh, but before that, we're just going to show a video of uh, another pass winner or winners, uh, Jack and Dermot, uh, students from Limerick, uh, who made a planter and um, visited as part of the winning the award, uh, got to go on a student study visit to Malawi. We'll get to see here um, Jack and Dermot um, displaying their design for a seed planter. Uh, we are really interested in students and teachers expanding their their views and uh, and looking to research uh, global issues and even challenges that are not affecting us here in Ireland directly, but communities uh, elsewhere in the world. When we went to the first village, we met the lead farmer and the fallow farmers as well. We introduced the planter to them and we explained how it worked, how we break the soil, doing all in one action for the planting it. Well obviously coming out here we were a bit anxious and we didn't know how it would be received because we kind of felt it would be a complete new culture shift and that they'd reject it, but um, they all seemed to really accept it. <laughs> One of the major things that they suggested was to actually use a lot of bamboo. That would be so easy to produce as well from the cost point of view and to repair in future. We were talking to some of the students and they had different suggestions to modify the device and we were really delighted to see their engagement. To say it was great is an understatement. They, they were so enthusiastic about it, they, could, they really bought in to the vision of what we could achieve with the planter. I think one of the first things we want to do is do a few more experiments to see the best possible model for the device before it is implemented in the field. We've made great contacts over here with the Irish Embassy through Luana University and through the actual Self-Help Africa programme. So once we get back to Ireland, I can just start sending off emails and just get the conversation going first of all and see what difference we can make with it. So that um, just gives you a, a, a flavor of a, a student study visit, uh, that one to Malawi, and, um, and how the winners of the award get to showcase their, their idea, their research uh, to students and, and uh, farmers and agricultural experts uh, in one of our program countries. So Timothy, uh, being one of our winners, uh, in 2018. Maybe you could tell us, Timothy, uh, a little bit about the project uh, that won the award and how that led you to visiting Uganda and perhaps how that has shaped your, your decision since to leading to you to what you're doing now. Yeah, um, thanks, Aaron. Um, so uh, back in transition year in, in 2018, uh, I entered a project into the BT Young Scientist uh, called an investigation into using CRISPR-Cas9 to genomic, uh, genomically edit paramecium quadratum uh, to purify Vibrio cholera infected water. Um, so I was working on the project to basically investigate um, on how to modify microorganisms to feed on the cholera bacteria um, to purify water in the global south. So the idea for the project was was a mix of stories from my uncle who actually visited um, Africa and then also uh, hearing and reading about genetic engineering at the time. Gene editing was extremely expensive um, and really complicated, but now with, the, with this new technology, um, scientists uh, can in, uh, inactivate or embed new uh, genes into DNA um, and it's really a game changer. The idea was to use um, CRISPR to, to edit paramecium, uh, which is found in the same water uh, bodies as Vibrio cholera, um, and have it feed on the actual bacteria. So then the, the water can be actually clean for, for drinking in the global south. Um, you know, during the project, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy from the start. Um, facing many obstacles as, as students who have entered the BT before uh, definitely definitely know the, the situation. 
Um, so, for example, where I had to use two machines in actually processing the, the uh, paramecium for, for CRISPR development. Um, and one of them was, let's say, extracting the DNA. Um, and then the other was actually amplifying the DNA for, for research. So both these machines, uh, a PCR machine and the microcentrifuge machine, um, one to get access to them uh, in, in a college or university here in Ireland was very hard for, for a student, but uh, also that uh, if I was to buy them, they would have cost uh, from around 2,000 to 4,000 euro. I decided to, to put another challenge on myself and actually build the machines myself. Um, so kind of learning as I went and from experience I have with Coder Dojo and, and other technology projects, uh, I developed the machines. I was fortunate enough then, as Aaron said, to, to win the Science for Development Award for my project work. Um, and then as a, a part of the award, uh, I was lucky enough to, to travel to Uganda with South of Africa and Irish Aid uh, the following year. Um, the visit to Uganda was, was amazing and to, to see firsthand what South of Africa are doing um, and Irish Aid are doing there. Um, and it was really eye-opening experience um, to, to get involved in the communities and also present my project work. The project has really led on to, to a new research um, and has continued to contribute to, to help the Global South. So right now I'm, I'm working on a social enterprise in UCC uh, called Reframe. So we're committed to providing sustainable transport uh, for students and uh, by developing uh, frames for, for bikes and commuter bikes made from recycled plastic. Uh, so where we're, we're collecting plastic from the university um, and then basically molding, molding the bike frames um, so they can be used in a, in a circular economy fashion. Um, how this connects back to, to the Global South uh, is the same reason that we're, we're doing it here in Ireland for university students, which is uh, we have we have a transport problem and, and so do they in the Global South. So I saw during my, my trip to, to Uganda that people uh, have to overcome the challenge of distance and access to sustainable transport. Um, so what we're working as an end goal for Reframe is to provide bikes to the Global South. That would be two things. So a form of sustainable transport and then also uh, provide as the rider um, cycles that they can generate electricity, um, which then can be stored in a battery on the bike and then can be used to, to power fans, power lights at night um, when they get home. So it, it provides a better way of transport for rural Africans um, and provides renewable clean energy, um, as well as then giving independence and allowing them to, to try. Brilliant, uh, that's amazing. Uh, is, is, um... Is there anything publicly available about Reframe? We're a part of uh, Anoctus, which is uh, a social enterprise uh, kind of organization for students. So that's where we're kind of working towards as well. So yeah, I can send in information about the, the work we're doing. That would be brilliant. Um, great stuff. Um, so yeah, maybe while you're doing that, Timothy, uh, and also have uh, your thinking cap on uh, about possible adv advice uh, that you could give students and teachers that are thinking about uh, project areas for the next Young Scientist competition. But maybe first, could I ask the, the students in Clonakilty, do you have any particular uh, points of advice for students or, and teachers that are, are thinking to enter the BT Young Scientist? Well, uh, my advice would definitely be that uh, in the coming years, sustainability and uh, Sort of environmental uh, issues will be a big uh, sort of thing for, I, I presume it will be a big sort of thing for young scientists. There'll be a big emphasis on it. So it, it doesn't really matter which like area of uh, the young scientists you enter in, be it uh, the biological area or even social sciences or um, the technology, as long as it relates back to the environment in some way and sustainability is a good like uh, effort to put in. Yeah. Um... My advice probably, um, if you have an idea, definitely start it. Don't just wait until the young scientist starts and it's a competition to do it. Uh, it's really great to have the time and the passion for doing something. So if you want to do it, definitely start early. 
and continue developing, developing it over time because that's the way you can get your project fully um, realized. Yeah, great. And uh, there's a question in the chat for, for you two actually about um, how much uh, help the school was. Uh, like, do, did you get access to, to equipment and, and the labs in school? Yeah, uh, the labs were incredibly important for the project. We pretty much used them every step of the way. Without the equipment in the labs, I don't think the project could have gone as, uh, ahead as far as it did. And, and going back to you, Timothy, any um, thoughts on uh, advice to, to new entrants to the BT Young Scientist? Um, yeah, I suppose one of the, the biggest points or uh, piece of advice that I kind of took away from developing projects over the years for uh, BT is the, the fantastic opportunity that students have to, to get an opinion about your project work. Um, so by others, I mean people who are in the field that you're, you're researching or, or studying, um, because after all, really, they're, they're the best equipped with the knowledge and, and support to give you uh, on, on your project. Definitely don't be afraid to email as, as many people as you can uh, in your specific field. Um, they can only really say two things, which is like, yes, they'll be more than happy to help you or no, they, they don't really have the time. Here in Ireland, we have a fantastic network of universities and institutes that, that have wonderful lecturers and researchers um, dedicated to research projects. So, you know, from my experience of contacting as many people as I could, um, that they're more than happy to help in any way that they can to focus on the problem um, that you're researching uh, or trying to solve is the biggest thing. Um, you know, can it, can it have a wide impact? Uh, who, who will benefit from it, uh, from the solution? Um, another thing, does it tie in with the sustainable development goals, uh, especially with, let's say, uh, a science for development project? Will you have sufficient time between now and the actual BT exhibition to have a compelling amount of to, of work for the judges. And then finally, um, see yourself if you're going to be motivated to work on, on the topic or problem uh, for the length of time until the exhibition, uh, because you'll need that motivation, you know, coming up to the exhibition to actually progress the work and get it finished. Brilliant, some, some really good uh, suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so just to, just to uh, round off everything, because um, we're reaching the end of our, our time here. Uh, thanks to everyone and the, and the panelists for your inputs. But just to bring it back to creating ideas, um, it was mentioned, that, there's a couple of things that I mentioned that um, about the access to labs being so important to the students in chronic guilty, but what can you do if you don't have such access? Um, but like Timothy mentions that you can ask for help uh, and you never know what access you might be given by uh, your local schools or uh, science uh, companies uh, and universities in your area. Uh, and also while preparing for this webinar, I was speaking to one of our lead uh, agriculture ex experts here or advisors in, for Self Help Africa, and he's very heavily involved with the BT Young Scientist also. And he mentioned that this area that we're focused on of biology and ecology is actually one of the strongest areas to look into as a citizen scientist. So as an amateur scientist, um, because it's really down uh, a lot of the time to observation uh, and not necessarily having access to uh, the equipment and the machines and the labs. So he had a couple of areas that he suggested uh, would be worth uh, exploring for project ideas. And uh, Axon mentioned uh, hydroponics. So this is growing plants, food, uh, trees even, maybe seedlings, uh, but not in the soil. So in other systems, in particular, the, the, the growing medium that you put your seedlings in there's a, a medium called phytocell, uh, F-Y-O-T-C-E-L-L, -L, um, which is a, me a nutritious medium for seedlings to grow in. But 
how that is packaged uh, and uh, shared out or held for each plant and where to put them uh, uh, is an area of research. So uh, how to maximize growing areas and find new areas to grow. So the idea of growing uh, vertically up walls uh, and in, uh, on rooftops, these kind of I innovative ideas to maximize areas for growing uh, food and maybe even growing young trees that then are planted out. One other suggestion was greenhouse gases and the fact that a lot of focus is on carbon, uh, but less focus is on methane. The problem for methane is agriculturally based and, and cattle gets a lot of focus. Um, but apparently the melting of permafrost uh, is, is a big issue uh, and re the releasing of methane. Uh, so there's a, a, an area to look into. Uh, as a suggestion. And this term of citizen scientist, uh, if you look that up, uh, you can find all sorts of projects that cut in, in Ireland. Uh, in Europe, there's a, a whole association of um, science bodies and institutions promoting scientists uh, or citizen scientist programs that you can get involved with straight away, a bit like um, uh, Christopher and, and Malachi said there's not, not to wait, but find what you're interested in and get involved and your project will come out of that. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to say something uh, just uh, to finish off, but it may be Axon, do you want to say uh, a final word and a, and a, a cheerio? Uh, sure, uh, thanks for, for, for having me. And uh, just to be sure that every research that is undertaken by anyone is welcome in the development sphere because the numerous challenges we face and are here for with us for a long time. And one other area of possible research is uh, the one that we've noticed is aeroponics alongside hydroponics. With the aeroponics where we are using um, uh, air uh, or spray onto the fruits and vegetables instead of using the water Right now, it's highly tech. We are trying to find ways of making it uh, user-friendly user to the smallholder farmers. We've done that with hydroponics. It started off high tech, but now it's been localized. And we're looking at ways of possibly localizing aeroponics. Um, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Brilliant, yeah. So again, uh, the idea of, of innovation, but it has to be uh, practical, it has to be accessible. Uh, to yeah. communities, it has to be affordable, and in itself, it has to be sustainable. If you remember the sure. planter in the video of Jack and Dermot being made out of uh, metal, a steel, I imagine, and that the local um, farmers very quickly noticed how they could innovate their idea and make it out of bamboo, uh, sure. which was a, a local resource. Um, uh, Jesse, are you still there? Would you like to say something and, and cheerio? Yeah, well, I would like to say thanks so much for having me. And I would also kind of like to say that um, when it comes to biology, you don't have to have very high tech equipment. It, I, it can be intimidating, especially in BT Young Scientists, where people have very high tech equipment and they've done these things. But really in biology, all you need is time and a curiosity in something. And a few years back, I think a guy got um, a BT Young Scientist prize for finding an antibiotic in a blackberry bush. And he just took an extract from the blackberry bush and put it on some uh, bacteria and saw that it had an antibacterial property and stopped the bacteria growing. So I really want to like encourage people that if you don't have access to a big lab you don't have access to things and um, well number one you can build them like timothy did but also you don't need to have them you can just have the curiosity and take your time and look at something which which you're interested in and it is possible to do good science without a lot of money brilliant that's a that's a great uh, way to close so um yeah so thanks to everyone who has attended today um, and we are going to run uh, another uh, such webinar in coming up shortly, uh, and we'll let you know about that. That one uh, will be similar, another category of uh, the BT Young Scientist, and other winners, part, another past winner, scientists from our programs, 
and most importantly, a, a, a student or student group that were involved in this year's uh, BT Young Scientists uh, telling you about their project and their experience. Uh, so thank you very much. You, you are free to leave uh, and uh, get off the screen for a while um, and, and, and stretch and enjoy, uh, get outside and see what you can observe. Now, now that we have our science, uh, bi biology and ecology uh, eyes on, and uh, maybe you'll be interested to go and find out a bit more about mycelium uh, and seaweed uh, around, uh, underneath our feet and in under our seas in, uh, in and around Ireland. So thank you very much. Thanks everybody. And, uh, hopefully we'll see you for the next one in, in June, June 2nd. But we'll let you know. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.